This country belongs to God Almighty. A powerful minority is on the rise with a particular vision of America. You cannot separate God from politics. You can't take him out of our government. It's one of the oldest and most influential currents in U.S. politics. But in a country deeply divided, the Christian right has found a new voice. We desire to live in a Judeo-Christian nation with Judeo-Christian values. It claims Christianity is under attack and that God belongs in government. With pastors preaching its message in churches and its beliefs guiding ultra-conservative candidates in the midterm elections. I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. The movement is known to many as Christian nationalism and the far right is taking it to the extreme. We are the Christian Taliban. Some are warning that this is fundamentally undemocratic. It was amplified by Donald Trump. We're going to protect Christianity, and I can say that. I don't have to be politically correct. Powered by his election loss, it broke cover at the storming of the Capitol on January 6 last year. Christ's holy name we pray. You can't diminish what happened on January 6 from what's happening in some sanctuaries on Sunday morning. Their crusade is starting from the ground up and education is the front line. Our school board meetings have police officers at the meetings to escort people out who get too out of control. To understand this moment in U.S. politics, you have to understand this movement. I met people across the country who feel they're battling for the soul of America. Tarrant County, known for conservative churches, wealthy white neighborhoods, and good schools. It's America's largest Republican urban community, and it helped elect Donald Trump. But in 2020, Joe Biden won here by a hair. This politically crucial corner of Texas has become a testing ground for how conservatives can maintain their grip. It's 6.30 in the morning. Like every parent, Lainey Hawes is rushing to get her children ready for the day. But in the past few months, she spent more and more of her time focused on schooling, fighting back against what she believes is growing conservative and Christian influence in the classroom. When we first got here, everything was mild. School board meetings were boring. Um, and then everything ramped up to this, and this is where we are now, and it's a fight, right? Our school board meetings have police officers at the meetings to escort people out who get too out of control. School boards are ground zero of the culture wars taking place across the country. In Tarrant County, they're churning with disputes over what children are taught, about sexuality, gender identity, the history of racism, and over what they should be allowed to read. There's only two genders, and guess what? Teachers shouldn't be forced to use your freaking made up fantasy pronouns. Fight like hell! This evasive censorship is much more than politics. This is about lives. Queer youth are at a substantially higher rate for suicide compared to the national average for adolescents. Not having support from your home, your peers, and your school means adverse mental health effects and eventually suicide attempts. Transforming low-profile elections into high-stakes political conflicts. And central to that is Christianity, but not through the pews. Remember when America stood for things like honor, freedom, personal responsibility, and faith? Enter a Texas cell phone company on a mission to protect conservative Christian values. Patriot Mobile spent nearly half a million dollars supporting 11 candidates in four districts. All of them won. 11, 11, 11 seats on school boards took over four. It's part of a new playbook by Republicans to take over politics from the ground up backed by political operatives like former Trump advisor Steve Bannon. One of the keys is these school boards, right? The school boards are the key that picks the lock. Talk to us about what you did in Tarrant County. Since then, those school boards have begun to put new restrictions on books and gender identity issues. The owner of Patriot Mobile, Glenn Story, recruited longtime political operator Lee Wamsgans to help mobilize the company's Christian message. As a mother and uh, of, you know, school-age kids, it's really quite concerning. We have never, in a 
time in, in these cities that we were dealing with had Christianity so, um, so attacked. Um, attacked, what do you mean? Oh, look at some of the public, um, the public comments in school boards and people c calling Christianity a, a terrible, racist, bigoted thing. And the reason we started with school boards is because that is the level of government that is in fact, it, that is most impacting the future of our country. What we were seeing is the leftist indoctrination instead of education. So you feel you have a responsibility to bring God back into the schools in some way? No question. That's what you're doing? No question. We need to have a little bit more of faith in schools in the sense of we have to remove what I feel is ungodly stuff out of the school. Or put what he feels is godly into the school. Recently, Texas passed a law saying schools had to display posters of the national motto if they were donated. Patriot Mobile delivered hundreds. Hello. Hey. Laney and other parents Hi, saw an opportunity to take a stand. Hey. I'll grab this one. I'm going to try. Yeah. Shravan Krishna has two children in school. He asked students to design signs that would include them. These were the voices he felt were unheard. Arabic speakers, transgender and gay kids. The school board initially rejected the signs. The issue has gone to court. Schools shouldn't be a place where you have people competing with which card is the best card. <laughs> right. right. But that's where we are. Yeah. So it should never be that. You know, keep, keep your religion to yourself, your religious institutions, churches, temples, right, houses. Or accept all gods. Yeah, or, it, or exactly, make it a place where everything, exactly. ev Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. For Laney and Shravan, the signs may have been a political stunt but they see something much more sinister at work. We see the Republican Party who has decided one of their goals is to bring God into schools. And that is the plan long term, is to bring God also into the government. So to me, it's anti-American to try and bring Christian ideology into our schools or into our government. Our country is based on allowing people to make that choice for themselves. I raised the sign controversy with Patriot Mobile. It's created a great uproar because folks just hate the concept of in God we trust. And so, and my response is, look, it's the national motto. We're not doing anything other. And if you don't like it, take every bill out of your pocket and throw it away because it says it on every bill, every coin. You don't think it was an issue of whose God? No. And whose God do we trust? No. Because the alternatives brought forward were in, in Arabic and I, in, you know, LGBT colors. I'm sure colors. that it, has, it was more political than just the word God. Right. All right, you guys ready? For all parents here, this boils down to the future of their children and who gets to shape what that will become. The concerns I found in Texas echo resoundingly through the conservative Christian establishment, this fear of a cultural takeover by what they label the radical left. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, is one of the largest in the world, wow. training leaders who are shaping the future of the evangelical church. Have you and other Christian leaders taken on a more overtly yeah. political role? Well, inevitably, because, you know, Christian preachers didn't have to preach about LGBTQ issues in any sense we, as we do now because those weren't issues in the culture. No one was talking about them. For Moeller, this shift has been a fundamental change for both the country and the church. I think for conservative Christians, there has been a dawning awareness of the fact that whereas the society basically agreed with us on almost every important issue, I mean, the, the overlap, if you take a Venn diagram, was so overwhelming that outsiders would call the United States a Christian nation. So something's clearly changed, and uh, conservative Christians in this country are now in a paradox or a predicament. I think that's why you see such a, uh, well, you, you know, it'd be called by those who don't like it, the rise of the new Christian right or uh, the, uh, the awakening of uh, the Christian vote in the United States. Well, there's a reason for that. The rise of the new Christian right is called Christian nationalism by some. The belief that America was founded as a Christian nation and that the government should keep it that way, blurring the line between church and state. So Christian nationalism is a new term for a very old 
phenomenon. So it privileges uh, a religious identity uh, for, uh, with citizenship in its most virulent form. It turns out to also have an ethnic or racial uh, component to it. Uh, in the U.S., that component has been around European descent or whiteness, um, really, as it has developed in the country. So uh, when I talk about Christian nationalism in the U.S., I usually talk about white Christian nationalism. Donald Trump was seen as defending their cause when he entered the White House. We're going to protect Christianity, and I can say that. I don't have to be politically correct or... And it was the storming of the Capitol that showed just how much religious and political identities had begun to merge on the right, bonded by a belief that the election had been stolen. Jesus Christ, we invoke your name! Amen! Amen! Many reject the Christian nationalist label as a leftist smear. But a few right-wing politicians are embracing its holy rhetoric. We need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. The church is supposed to um, direct government, not the opposite yeah. uh, way. The church is supposed completely. to influence government, and, yeah. and, and we need to be so involved in what is going on in our government. Online, extremists have taken it even further. We are the Christian Taliban. This is, this is the era of Christian nationalism. What's different now uh, is that the country's no longer majority white and Christian. As recently as 2008, when Barack Obama was first running uh, for president, our first African-American president, uh, the country was actually 54% white and Christian, so comfortably majority white and Christian. Uh, that number today is 44%. Uh, percent. And I think that threat, right? White Christians are no longer knowing they're in control uh, demographically, culturally, politically. Um, it's why we're seeing it kind of come to the fore in the current context. Prominent voices in the black church are also sounding the alarm about the racial implications of the movement and warned that the spirit of the January 6th attack was not contained in the Capitol. You can't diminish what happened on January 6th from what's happening in some sanctuaries on Sunday morning. You can't separate this passion to overthrow the nation's capital with violence on January 6th from the rhetoric that you hear on Christian radio. You can't separate this desire to pull down elected officials and maybe even call for their murder versus what we hear, frankly, from people all across the nation, even elected officials, who are praying for the death of the president. Many pastors were at the Capitol that day. Oh, there he is. I traveled to Tennessee, deep in the Bible Belt, where one of them continues to preach. So Pastor Ken has asked me to meet him here on this overpass to watch him waving flags. It seems a bit of a patriotic stunt. I think he does it a lot. Hello, Pastor Ken. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Doing good, thank you. God bless you. Thank you good very much. And here. God bless America, and God bless Donald Trump. <laughs> Ken Peters has denounced the violence of the Capitol riot, but still defends what he sees as a patriotic mission. Come on! We do feel like God has a special plan for this country, and he still has a plan for this country. And on January 6th, you felt that was under threat? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We felt like the, the enemy, meaning leftists uh, who don't like Christians, um, had stolen our nation. Peter's Patriot Church is one of a growing number of non-denominational startup congregations that say they want to take back the country for God. I was a little unsure of what to expect. As someone who grew up in the church, what I heard here was not the gospel I knew, political activism as an act of worship. The LGBTQ and the left is saying, oh, you're a church, separation of church and state. Get in the stands. You can't fight the fight. You can't play in the game. Church, preachers, you stand up in the stands, separation of church. An aggressive response to a sense of being under siege. Christians are going to have to get feisty. They're going to have to get in the fight a little bit and quit sticking their head in the sand and being completely pacifist when it comes to politics. For him, that means a crusade against abortion. Hey, if God can overturn Roe v. Wade, he can do anything, amen? And ending same-sex marriage. Yeah, I want to exclude certain types of relationships, sexual relationships from the term marriage. It's special to us. It's in the Bible. It's something we really care about. And you want a government that would impose that? 
I want a government that keeps marriage what it's always been. What he preaches from the pulpit is meant to be taken to the polls. We endorse Monty Fritz. We endorse him. And his message seems to be resonating. Patriot churches have expanded to several locations. Peters says they're attracting followers from more liberal states. To me, this isn't anything new. It's just how I even grew up, God, family, country. That it's, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And um, some try to, you know, shame us for loving our country. I mean, this is where God placed us. We wanted to come and find a place that wasn't afraid to take a stand, that wasn't afraid to speak out if there were issues that they thought um, needed to be spoken about. We are definitely a Christian nation and should be a Christian nation. So to try to separate politics from the church is asinine. It cannot be done. Um, and if you're doing it, you're pro if you are doing that, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> I wanted to know if most churches in Tennessee felt the same way. So I continued my journey to the city of Franklin, south of Nashville, in a county that's been called the new frontier for American evangelical Christianity. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for another week. Uh, I joined an early morning meeting of community activists who work with the homeless, led by Pastor Kevin Riggs. He grew up as a conservative evangelical and had dreams of becoming a mega church pastor. But a close reading of the Bible convinced him God cared more about social justice. There's division within the church like I've, I haven't seen it. I've had friends who were pastors of churches and because they spoke out um, uh, against um, the religious right or against President Trump, uh, then they're asked to leave their church. What's the threat, do you think? What's the danger? You, you hear the term a lot in, in evangelical cir circles that we're fighting a cultural war. And I think you could very easily replace the word culture with civil. And that's kind of where we are. And it's been a, a cold civil war where it's all been about ideology and fighting for these things, but that could very quickly become violent. Um, it, it could become, you know, the, the, um, the, the right will have a tendency to take up arms um, to protect their, their right. There are pastors who seem to court controversy, even thrive off it. Greg Locke burned Catholic rosaries and Harry Potter books on Halloween night, objects of sorcery and witchcraft, he called them. We don't have to be so careful with what we say. Or... I met him in his studio near Nashville, where he films his popular webcast about faith and politics. The social media, that's the biggest part of it. I think it's about 4.6 million people across all the, you know, Facebook and all the platforms. Of course, no more Twitter. I was suspended for life from Twitter. But uh, at the end of the day, we literally have millions of people that watch. And then that brings a lot of people to the church. Good evening, Global Vision family. Give the Lord some praise in his house. Locke made a name for himself as a Trump pastor, but he really took off by challenging the COVID shutdown. And yes, he was also at the Capitol riot. You ain't seen an insurrection yet. He preaches politics to his following that can sound like extremist rants. You God-hating communist America, you'll find out what an insurrection is, because we ain't playing your garbage. We ain't playing your mess. My Bible says that the church of the living God. So you also said in your church that Democrats are demons. Mm -hmm. Do you really believe that? Absolutely. What does I that mean? I believe the Democratic Party is demonically energized. And so I told them, look, if you believe in butchering babies and you celebrate stolen elections and you don't want freedom and you're against the Second Amendment or even the First Amendment, then leave. You can leave anytime you want to. It's one thing to be tired of a party. It's another thing to say they are evil, they are demonic. Right, but I don't mind saying that. Couldn't this be a way of inciting to violence those people who listen to you, either in your church or online, because they might take it a step further? If this is evil, I should go after it. You know, every bucket sits on its own bottom. People have been saying that for years. Oh, if you follow Jesus, then that means you're going to make a whip and go into a church and run people out. It's not quite the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You're calling fellow Americans evil and putting it in the context of an apocalyptic battle between good and evil. There is an apocalyptic battle between good and evil. And so that is the kind of language that could be used to incite violence against such people. Well, it could no? be and is are two very different things. That's not my responsibility. I have responsibility to You don't to see that as a responsibility no. to stay away from possibly inciting violence? No, I'm not inciting violence. Mm. I'm preaching the Bible. Of pastors getting... Locke is now preaching the Bible with a growing emphasis on deliverance from demons. There's none of the political rhetoric tonight. 
Well, you can see that Greg Locke really knows how to draw a crowd. This is emotional, it's powerful, it's dramatic. He knows how to develop a following. So you feel like throwing up, you feel something coming After the service, people gathered at the front seeking prayer to be freed from their demons. This kind of mass deliverance service is tapping into a very old tradition of Pentecostal revival in the United States. It breaks through in new ways when people are hungry for the experience of a living and mighty God. For those here, the Spirit of God was moving. But how is this mix of charismatic evangelism, right-wing politics and Trumpism playing out in the midterm elections? I do think we're seeing kind of a test run of some of this rhetoric um, in the midterms. And I, I think it is a, a, a kind of dip the toe in the water, see how this plays on the campaign trail with a rev up to 2024. One of the best examples of a candidate backed by this new religious right is the Republican contender for Pennsylvania governor, Doug Mastriano. He's a former military man campaigning as a Christian warrior, framing this election as spiritual warfare. Don't be held in bondage by those lies and tricks of the enemy, because Satan sees the potential you have in Jesus Christ here to change the course of history. We stand at a crossroads right now in Pennsylvania, and this is our time. We're taking our country back, and it starts right here. I went to Pennsylvania to find out what voters were thinking, traveling deep into Amish country. I'd met Jeff and Janice Gavin at a campaign event. Their friends, Chris and Bobby Foley, were visiting from out of state. I'm going to be voting conservative, not necessarily Republican, because I look at both sides. But most of what I hear from the Democratic side is anti-me. I don't align with that message. And uh, What about Mastriano? Mastriano, no. I'm well, well behind. I, I, he has to win for the state to recover. Do you believe that Mastriano has been called by God? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. What do you think that God has called them to do? To get involved politically. Well, if you read the Bible and all the stories in the Bible, he uses people to move and to do things in God's yes. will. Yes. And God has called upon many yes. people yes. to take back this world yes. from and this who is God black. calling to take back America now? Well, I think he appointed, he did appoint. This is going to be a long turn, too. It's not going to be something that's going to happen with this election. Right. I mean, it's going to take a while to get this country back the way it was. Because yeah, it, it took 30, 40 years to, to, to turn it around. Probably now, longer. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it may take a couple, it may take 2024. Now, 2022 is going to be a really big... Real effective. Effective. It's gonna, It'll definitely mm -hmm. set the, the pace on what's going to happen from yeah. there on out. Yeah. But I think God's going to come down and he's going yeah. to make things change. And when you've taken the country back, mm -hmm. what is that going to look like? Um, I think it's going to look good because you have the, you'll have God back in the, in the government. You get God back in the schools. You get God back. You get the Ten Commandments. Think about living by the Ten Commandments. None of our kids even know the Ten Commandments. After we spoke, they headed to an event where the Christian right is finding a new voice. Where are my Christian nationalists at in this room? Thank you. This is the Reawaken white, Tour, a traveling roadshow attracting tens of thousands of people as it crisscrosses the nation. You cannot separate God from politics. You can't take him out of our government. Its attendees are anti-vax, anti-mask, and they're invoking God to stop the steal. On the sidelines, hundreds of people queued to be baptized by water and by the Spirit. This really feels like a church service. And it's felt like a church service several times today, but then again, it felt also like a political rally. So it's both. I mean, I've never really seen such a mixture of religion and politics. Top billing was shared by a handful of Trump loyalists. The general who served two presidents, then convicted of lying to the FBI. ABC wants to know if you want to do No, no, no. Okay. The political operative, convicted of lying to Congress, collecting money for his legal fees. Eric Trump! And the man himself dialed in while his son was on stage. We're going to bring this country back because our country's never been in such bad shape. It's a carnival of chaos. Those who are preaching election fraud and COVID conspiracies and Christ. And that's the power of the message. 
The midterm election will be the first test of how this plays out at the polls. This new Christian right is out of step with the direction of the country, fighting against changing moral values, framing that as a battle against evil. What it ends up doing is turning political opponents into enemies, right? And that's a kind of threat uh, to the whole democratic project. I hope it ends up in us finding a way to have our own maybe regions of the nation and living peacefully together. It's a minority, but backed by powerful politics. And if Republicans win big, it could become an outsized influence, pushing the party and the church further to the right.